taken from three books. Uh, it says in Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6, Surely our gifts he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging are we healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under the heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing, a time to search and a time to give up as lost, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart and a time to sew together, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate. In Matthew 5, 14 through 19, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Periodically, some parishioners have asked me, both within this church and within former churches I have served, in light of the potential within North Korea and everything else going on in the world, do you believe that we are living in the end times? And my answer is simple. Since the day of Christ's ascension, all of creation has been living in the unfolding of the end times. And if we step back and take a broad look at our world today, we may agree we are seeing something much like a Dickens novel, The Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Right now in our midst, there are more positive things happening on the horizon of humanity than ever before. Simultaneously, there seems to be more negative events, emotions, and outcomes than ever before. Just 10 short years ago, who could have projected walking into a church sanctuary and seeing candles lit on an altar in honor and memory of those who were guilty of doing nothing more than going to a Christian church here in the United States of America? In the writing of Ecclesiastes, we find the repetitious promise that tells us in spite of our view of things, there's really nothing new under the sun. Isaiah clarifies this truth a bit more by discussing the truths of humanity and saying, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. If we don't understand the nature of sheep, we miss the derogatory inference that is cast against us. Some of us think of sheep as soft and warm and cuddly creatures that pleasantly graze out among the fields and just simply enjoy the life they were given. And if that were all there was to know about sheep, we would not at all be bothered by the scriptural analogy. But in my first church as a student pastor, I had three sheep farmers that were quick to educate me about the proclivities of sheep. 
Sheep look harmless, docile, passive, and pleasant. But behind that sheepish exterior is a stubborn, self-absorbed, narrow-minded rigidity that tends more times than not to get themselves into frequent trouble. Sheep spook easily. At the first hint of a potential problem, sheep tend to panic. And in their panic, they tend to crowd together. While crowding together, they have the tendency to literally smother one another. And if not managed properly and cautiously, have the capability of inadvertently killing one another in their perception of defending themselves. Sheep have the ability to act and react in a group setting that is foolish, destructive, and thoughtless in its ways. So now the question, have we seen the same behaviors in humans? Now before any of you say, that's not at all like human beings because we have logic and skill and intelligence. Before you say all those things, consider this. While most of us this past week heard of the more than 15 lives that were lost in California because people chose not to obey the police evacuation order for the mudslides, I'm guessing that the vast majority of us in this sanctuary did not hear that this past Tuesday, as a soccer match was ending in Accra, Guyana, police fired off some tear gas to keep people from rushing onto the field to celebrate with their team. And in a panic reaction, 126 people trampled themselves to death fearing they were in the midst of a terrorist attack. Hundreds more were injured. And this is the third soccer stadium panic to strike Africa in the last 30 days alone. Our media tells us some of the things going on in the world. And we need to have a broader vision than what just some want to tell us. From a different passage familiar to many of us, Ecclesiastes tells us there is a time to tear apart and a time to sew together. If we are honest with ourselves, we will admit that as a people, we are living in some of the most divisive times experienced as a nation since the days of the Great Depression. Yes, there was a lot of opinions during the, gate, the days of Watergate. There was a lot of opinions during the days of Iran-Contra. There was a lot of opinions during the Vietnam War. But even in those days, we could talk about our thoughts and our beliefs, and we could disagree with one another if we chose to. Today, we're fearful of even sharing our most superficial thought or belief for fear it might offend someone or that it might end our relationship because we have a different opinion than them. On one particular day in January one year ago, we witnessed the continuation of our Constitution in the swearing in of a new president. It was immediately followed the next day in Washington, D.C. with a protest rally that turned brutally violent and destructive. <laughs> this past year, we as a group of citizens could watch on videotape on most any network a group of white men and self-proclaimed neo-Nazis marching down the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia at the University of Virginia with lit torches in their hands surrounding an African-American church. The police asked the people in the church not to leave or it might create more problems. Meanwhile, outside the church, they were proclaiming that they were the alt-right movement with the slogan, White Lives Matter. 
But what were they rationally and logically proclaiming? Clearly, some must have known the imagery this scene would evoke, most especially for the African-American community that was locked in that church. It definitely brought back memories to me of KKK rallies that I had seen on the news and that I had witnessed firsthand when I lived in Kentucky. And while thankfully we have not experienced it in this house of worship, since the days of that election, some churches have experienced great declines in their ministries linked directly to this last presidential election. Some in their zeal for a particular candidate, pro or con, Republican or Democrat. Some have gone so far as to attempt to equate evangelical Christianity with being a Republican. And on this point, we need to be unequivocal. God is not nor has ever been a member of any political party. And God is not an American. If that offends you, I am sorry, but it is the biblical truth. Some attribute our divisiveness to the current broadcast media. Some attribute it to the things we see and read in social media, some to the Russians, and some simply look at the disappearing middle class and the simple economics to justify their moods, their positions, and their responses. Oh, you're ahead of me. That happens. Our bulletin and screen graphic illustration this morning, if you look at your bulletin cover, was taken here in Phoenix this past August when President Trump came to town to thank his core supporters in a political rally. Friends, every president of every party has their supporters and their detractors. But the current tone of repeated opposition is no longer civil or respectful. If Isaiah and Ecclesiastes reveal to us the true capacity of unobstructed human nature, then Jesus tells us through the Gospel of Matthew how things might truly become. His words paint a picture that every citizen in Judea knew. He said, A city set on a hill cannot be hid nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Several years ago, I went to the Holy Lands, and we landed around 9 p.m. After loading the buses and pulling out of the airport, we headed toward Galilee. And there along the hillsides were towns and villages all perched along the mountain ranges, glimmering in the darkness. And from our vantage point, we could make out the entire map layout of the city. You could see where all the streets were, where industry was, where downtown was, where the suburbs were, where the larger homes were. You could see everything about that town. It proclaimed their entire presence. Jesus says to his listeners, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And just as a city cannot be hid, neither can our choices, at least not from God. Some things are blatantly obvious, and we need no commentary to tell us their choices are immature, thoughtless, and fraught with danger. And yet we are reminded this is the normal behavior of sheep that blindly follow. This is the behavior found in some masses lately, which choose to follow, act, and react without any consideration of consequences or civility. Consider the aggressive driver who climbs up on your bumper and requires you to go faster or to get out of their way. The relentless robocalls that many of us have received continually asking us to do and to give something that we have no intention of doing or giving. 
the street corner beggar who is no longer satisfied to stand still and hold a sign, but approaches you at a stoplight with words that require of us rather than asking in humility. Our reaction and responses add to that sense of dread and in some cases fear of how simple tasks might evolve. In years gone by, if someone was approaching me on the road with their bright lights on, I would simply flash my lights to let them know your brights are on. Now when my wife catches me doing this, she scolds me and she says, you don't know how people react to that anymore. And a lot of people in cars now carry guns to let you know how they feel. And she is correct. But then what happens is our refusal to engage can also become the response of those who fail to see that their silence may also be participating in that time of tearing apart. Because in many scenarios, we know silence is assent. And while I cannot think of one single individual in this church that would have participated in any of those marches that I mentioned, we do collectively find ourselves in the midst of this pressure cooker mentality that continually asks us to respond in ways that match someone else's thoughts, someone else's beliefs, someone else's expectations, and perhaps to embrace someone else's grievances. Can we possibly get back to the slides where we start with the car that was circled by the shopping carts? I was looking online at how some people feel we can justify behavior. Now, I'll grant you I'm not happy when someone takes up four spaces. And that is certainly one way to let people know your displeasure. In a sense, it's almost comical, at least to me it was. But some of the other choices weren't quite so funny and could have endangered some person's lives. So how do we get other people to agree with or to conform to our opinions? What are our limits in letting others know our displeasure with their reluctance to comply to our standards? As a society, we can easily find people today are much more agitated, volatile, and in some cases anxious to respond to things they disagree with than ever before. A good number of individuals no longer merely hold opinions, but rather assert them to the point of confrontation and verbally seek affirmation and agreement from others. When some of you asked me last fall, who are you voting for? I said, I want you to study the issues. I want you to study their opinions. I want you to pray about it, and I want you to vote. But who the pastor votes for is not the important issue. Simple example can be found on our screen or in someone stating a position and then requiring of other people, don't you agree with me? And some people aren't willing to let it go when the person they're asking is silent. In two days, as a nation, we will be celebrating the commemoration of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And if any of us think that we have grievances worth airing, I think most of us would acknowledge our problems don't hold a candle to the issues that he and those like him were addressing in their day. But more importantly, no matter how offended and mistreated they were, they responded with passive rather than aggressive behavioral choices. In the 90s, the Christian church came out embracing four little letters, W-W-J-D. What would Jesus do? And perhaps today we need to consider that question once again. Jesus did not go looking for trouble, but when asked, he did not dodge or hedge his answers either. Ecclesiastes tells us there is a balance found in our time and in our behavior. 
Isaiah reminds us that unless we are cognizant of Christ and in keeping his will active in our life, we may be prone to act like sheep with each of us going our own way. Matthew reminds us, like a city set on a hill, God sees us and knows us in ways that we many times fail to see because we do not share his perspective or his insight. Jesus says to his would-be followers, you need not be like and follow everyone else. You can be different. You can show the difference. You can live that difference. And in doing so, you may become instrumental in leading others into my way, my truth, and the life I have uniquely planned for each of you. So in these days, may we fully discover and live out the true civility that only Christ can bring into our life and into our society. Let us pray. Our Lord, there's always something we can find to be upset about. We don't have to look hard. There's a lot of things that rub us the wrong way. And for a good number of those things, we have good reason. But you have asked us as your followers to prioritize. To know who and what comes first. So help us to set aside our cultural expectations, our social expectations, our political expectations, our economic expectations, help us to rediscover putting you first. Help us to discover how we might find your opinion amidst the disagreements and how we might be messengers of peace, messengers of understanding, messengers of civility. Lord, we know we live in a volatile world, but you have called us to be instruments of your love, your peace, and your grace. Help us to live these truths we ask these days in the name of Christ our Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen.